What's up and welcome in to another mailbag edition of Fantasy Baseball. Today, Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on the show, I promised you that we would get 5x5 five five Roto Strategy and that's what we'll do. We'll start off with that a little bit later on, followed by your mailbag questions. Thanks again to those watching us live on YouTube. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you're listening on the podcast side, make sure to download follow, and leave a five-star review. We do really appreciate it. And once again, before we get started, mentioned the other day a fun announcement. Fantasy Baseball Today is a finalist in the baseball category for the Sports Podcast Awards, and we are going up against some big names, and it is a voting system, which means that we need your help. You can scan the QR code in the top right corner if you're watching on video, or you can find the link in the podcast or YouTube description. You'll need to quickly create an account on their website, which I know is annoying, but doesn't take that long. It takes like 30 seconds. And then vote for FPT. Voting ends April 6th, and we would uh, really appreciate it if you can vote for us. Let's get into some 5x5 five five Roto strategy, the most traditional way to play fantasy baseball using the standard 5x5 five five categories, batting average, home runs, run scored, RBI, and steals. On the pitching side, ERA, whip, wins, strikeouts, and saves. Lineups are a little bit deeper. We've got 14 hitters, nine pitchers. It's a two-catcher format. Some of you listening to this who play head-to-head -head categories or head-to-head -head points might think that we are crazy for playing in a two-catcher format. Honestly, we might be. Five outfielders, one utility spot, one of each infield position, a corner and a middle, and then nine pitcher spots, which you can divvy up however you want. Six starters, three relievers, seven starters, two relievers. And I think the point here is to build the most balanced team as you possibly can. So, so Scott, we'll start with you. Do you have a general strategy in Roto? Do you maybe focus on the rate stats more like batting average, ERA, and whip? Because I've noticed later on in the season, if you are trailing in those categories, they are pretty hard to make up. Yeah. So I don't know that I have kind of a standing rule for that, but this year, I have tried to, I, I've i tried, you know, obviously I've, I've played the position scarcity game mainly. That's what I'm looking to do in the early rounds. But kind of a secondary goal of mine is to um, not, not get questionable batting average sources with those early picks. That That's part of the reason why I don't like drafting Bobby Witt in round two, why that's my least favorite of those stud third basemen. I always hope someone else takes them instead because yeah, that like you can get batting spat Bafford specialists late in the draft, but they're likely going to contribute not much of anything else. Like they may help in run scored, but they're not going to give you power. They're probably not going to give you speed. You know, I'm thinking like Luis Arias and Jeff McNeil types like they're there, but you're going to have to sacrifice so much that you'll wish you just invested in that category early when the kind of players who were providing a batting average were doing a lot of other things well as well. Um, so that is one I focus on early. But I mean, I, I feel like we're kind of in a place now where there, there's nothing you can, at least on the hitting side, that you can safely neglect early. Uh, in, in recent years there's been such an emphasis on stolen bases early because they're coming, they were becoming scarcer and fewer players were contributing them. I kind of felt like Roto drafts were trending toward, Oh, just draft all the base stealers until the base stealers are gone. And then you can worry about other things. But I think with the rule changes this year to encourage more base stealing with home runs becoming scarcer now um, with the, with the deadened ball being introduced last year, uh, I, I think home runs are just as critical to that's just as critical of a need to meet early. And I think it's kind of um, something that's being overlooked. Uh, we've talked about how there are only 23, 30 Homer guys last year. And the last of them available is Rowdy Telez. That's still mid draft. So nobody who had 30 homers is available after, after Telez goes off the board. We've talked about how Hunter Renfro, still a top 30 outfielder, I think for most of us is one of the last players being drafted who you feel like you can pencil in for 30 home runs. So it's, 
it's not like you can neglect anything in the early rounds. It's just, I don't feel like the batting average guys, the early round batting average guys are inflated because of their batting average. They're just, it, it's just more that there are these suspect batting average guys sprinkled in that I try to avoid. Chris, something we talked about when discussing head to head category strategy is that you can punt a category and you can still win on a weekly basis. You can win your entire league punting one or even multiple categories, if we're being honest. Can you do it in Roto? I think it's possible, but it's a lot harder to pull off. If you finish last in any category, you basically need to average a third place finish in all of the other nine categories. So uh, is it something that you try and do or try and avoid, I guess? The math gets tricky. Yeah, that that's the big thing is like, you think about probably first place in a roto league, you're probably looking at like 85 to 90 category points to win your, your roto league. And so you just start to do the math. If you get one point from stolen bases, well, then you've got to get 85 or 84 from the other nine categories. You start to do the math. Like you said, that's basically a third place finish probably a first or second place finish in a couple of other categories as well. It's just really hard to pull off. So when you talk about punting a category in Roto, you know, I do think it's possible to punt a category during the draft and not punt the category for the season. Like you can punt save specifically in your draft and still end up middle of the pack because middle of the pack and saves in most of your leagues is probably going to be something like 40 saves i mean it, it's it's a pretty it's going to be a pretty low number i don't i haven't done the the roto category targets thing this year unfortunately so i don't have the specific numbers from last year but you know just looking at like our memorial magazine draft last year uh middle of the pack and saves was 55 so that's two saves per week basically over the course of the season that's that's pretty doable but it's off obviously much easier if you have well we would have said edwin diaz it's kind of an interesting spot now where two of the stalwarts at the position edwin diaz and, and liam Hendricks, are are probably off the table for saves and those saves are going to come from somewhere you know david robertson or, or adam Adovino, maybe kendall graveman for the white Sox, but you know, we don't know exactly who those guys are going to be, but it's a lot easier when you can pencil in 35 saves from one guy. And then you only have to get one save per week to basically be middle of the pack. I think it's probably easiest to punt saves and steals if you're going to, because those are <clears throat> discrete categories that tend to have relatively low numbers that you need to compete. Although it's worth pointing out, saves middle of the pack was probably around 100 last year in a 12 team league that number is going to be higher this year because there are going to be more saves around the league so you probably need steals steals right? sorry yes yeah, steals so you're probably going to need more like 120 to be middle of the pack and, and steals and and you know probably 50 ish again in saves so like you can survive being middle of the pack in those categories but it's yeah so you're, you're not even talking about a true punt with steals and saves you're just saying not yeah I, I, and I, in the draft with the and i think it's worth I, I think it's worth making a point of there's a difference between punting in a draft and punting for the season and okay. it's hard you know I, I i think in in steals it's probably harder to make up that in season than it is because they're just yeah it, so it, few viable steals options who are also not going to hurt you you know jorge mateo stole a lot of bases yeah. last season but he kind of killed you in four other categories whereas there will be saves on the waiver wire and a lot of them yeah i, I mean you, you could you could luck into a big stolen base source who uh maybe isn't on people's radar at the start like sure. like a sal freelick yes maybe he gets called up early by the brewers and ends up running a lot for him and and, and he alone takes a big bite at, out of that steals category makes up several spots in the, in the standings there. Um, and, and the other thing about saves and steals is the players, a lot of the players who contribute them, or at least 
what's a better way of putting it? Those two contributions happen independently of the other contributions. Like home runs impact yes. all of the other hitting categories except for stolen bases. Stolen bases are kind of on an island there and saves sort of the same way among the pitching categories. So that that's another reason why you could at least think about uh, going light in those categories. I have I have never um, been compelled to do like a true punt in the category. And I, I know it's possible to win that way to just accept, okay, I'm only going to get one point in this category and you have to do that much better in all the other categories. People have won that way. But to me, you're kind of like putting yourself in a corner, you know, where mm -hmm. um, everything else has to go so right and there's not much maneuverability uh, towards your path to victory. So I, I never do it in, in, in instances where I've just kind of accidentally done it. I just missed out on all the base deals, missed out on all the save sources. Um, generally, I... Yeah, I'm trying to think of a situation where I had a good season doing that. I, I don't think so. I, I think maybe there have been times where I've uh, not really invested heavily in saves, just kind of took a few perspective save targets. And over the course of the season, I was able to piece together enough saves to finish fairly high in the category and win the league. It's getting harder to do that because there are so many um split save situations throughout bullpens across the league guys sharing the closer role that you can't you can't uh you can't be that assured of finding a big saves accumulator off the waiver wire and plus the competition for them is getting fiercer too particularly if you're talking about a weekly fab situation any new perspective save sources emerge the bidding tends to get very high and it's a low probability bid because you have to act so early on. Oh, this guy got a save Wednesday. Maybe he's next in line. Last point that I want to make on Roto is just a reminder. You only need to win a category by one statistic. That's all yes. you need to do. So in terms of roster construction, say you draft a Bobby Wood Jr. in the second round. You probably also don't want to have Corbin Carroll and Esteri Ruiz and a bunch of other speedsters on your team. You only need to win steals by one. In the category you don't need to win it by you don't get a prize by winning it for winning it by you know 40 steals so keep that in mind when building your roster and i think also when trading in season if you have an abundance of home runs and you are lacking batting average or steals then that's a very clear you know obvious trade that you want to try and make so keep that in mind and chris i think also <clears throat> to keep it in mind for pitching where if you build up a big lead in terms of wins and strikeouts, mm -hmm. then maybe you want to start to work in a few more relievers in that second half of the season just to try and pick up more saves. Maybe go with like five starters and four relievers, something like that, just to make up ground in the saves category. Yeah, absolutely. That That's the thing is that you, it, none of this is static. You're, the team that you draft is not the team you carry through the rest of the season. And your strengths on draft day are not the strengths or weaknesses that you're going to have all season. So, yeah, you just you have to be willing to be flexible. You have to be willing to, you know, make changes when you notice them. And also, you know, it's important to note that the strategy can really depend on what uh, type of league you're playing in, because there are some leagues that, you know, don't allow trading in an overall competition or, or something like that. So that that's another one that you know, that's, that's a part of the strategy as well, because in those kind of leagues, the, the team that you draft is going to be the one that you carry for most of the season. You're going to, your opportunities to, uh, to make changes are, are going to be limited. All right. Well, that's it for Roto. Let's get into your mailbag questions. And we are starting off with some emails. This one is from Omar. How would you all rank the following third baseman in a six by six head-to-head -head categories league with the extra hitting category being OBP. Does Scott stand by Devers first in this format? Devers, Machado, Austin Riley, and Bobby Witt Jr. Scott, I believe you were faced with this question in Tout Wars, which is OBP, and you actually mm. took Machado first. Yeah, I did. OBP, It was that league was OBP instead of batting average. This sounds like it's OBP in addition to batting average, so it's kind of double counting right? batting average in a way. Um, but you know, obviously this makes wit 
clearly the fourth. I think he is anyway, because he is terrible at OBP. Riley's not so great at OBP either. As for Machado and Devers, um, yeah. So my the main advantage Devers has over Machado, I think, is there's a there's a higher batting average ceiling. Like I think I think Devers' batting average could range from 280 to 320. I think Machado's batting average could range from 260 to 300. That's kind of how I view the two of them. So, I mean, Machado actually ended up with the better batting average of the two last year, I believe. But Devers, I, I think, has you know the higher ceiling overall there. But Machado does walk a little bit more than Devers. Mm -hmm. So that closes the gap. And it's already such a, for me, it's already you know kind of splitting hairs between the two because Machado might contribute some steals. Devers won't. So in this format, yeah, I'd go, I'd go Machado over Devers. This next one's from Robert. Chris has given me players like Corbin Burns and Brandon Woodruff because of some skills they had improved. And Scott has given me Jesse Winker the year he was great. Jordan Alvarez in his first year of awesome productivity, saying he was pretty much Mike Trout in a small sample, etc. They argued for why they were just awesome players and the focus wasn't so much on their ADP or value versus their ADP or price. I don't know if I'm reading that right. Uh, this year, most of the analysis has focused on value and not on skill changes or improvement for players. Yet, this is the area where I think you shine the most as a podcast. Can you identify some players who have shown skill improvements, changes, or some reasons why some players are just awesome? Yeah, I mean, I think this is more or less the breakouts conversation, right? Because sleepers are very price relevant. Busts are very price relevant. Breakouts, you know, the, the way we tend to talk about them, we don't worry so much about price. You know, I, I tend to be a little even uh, more, I don't know, not price sensitive. I don't know what the, what the word I'm looking for there. I just completely blanked. Uh, but I tend to not care about price at all when I'm talking about breakouts. And I'll, I'll call a second rounder a breakout if I think they're going to have the best season of their career. Bobby Witt can be a breakout candidate for sure this year. So, you know, th this is that's sort of what you're talking about here is breakouts. And so, like, when I think about this, I think about guys that we actually have, I think, spent a lot of time talking about this preseason guys like O'Neill Cruz, who just he's such an out like there are obvious limitations to his skill set and you can poke holes in his game, but like the upside outcome for O'Neill Cruz is as good as just about anybody in the game because his he's got such freakish skills. I think of Elo Jimenez, who, you know, has established himself, I think, as a one very injury prone player, but two, a very, very productive hitter who specializes in hitting for contact with power at a at a rate that not a lot of hitters do. So he's someone who I think, you know, could take a big step forward just by staying healthy. Christian Walker was one of the most improved hitters in baseball last season, but I do think he kind of gets saddled with a little bit of like a one year wonder kind of penalty. And I don't know if that's fair. He's actually been pretty good three out of the last four seasons, uh, 824, 792, 804 OPS in three of the last four seasons. But, you know, certainly last season, he was someone who took a big step forward and you can argue should have been even better based on the expected stats, 359 X Woba compared to a 346 mark. Yes, he plays in a tough park and that's going to make it hard for him to live up to that. But I think there's still room for Christian Walker to improve on what he did on, uh, on last season. And then uh, I'll go with three starting pitchers who I love to talk about Dustin may Reed Detmers and Patrick Sandoval may and Sandoval in particular, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, May, ever since the start of 2021, we've only seen about 70 innings, but he's been getting the strikeouts that he wasn't before that while maintaining the very, very good quality of contact suppression metrics. If he can put that together for 150 innings, I think Dustin May could be a, gosh, I don't know if I want to say a Spencer Strider type contributor this season because he's not going to get that many strikeouts, but like, Oh. The impact of a Christian Javier last season, I think Dustin May could give us that. Um, Reed Detmers, Scott, I know you love him. He had a, I think it was like a 304 ERA after coming back from uh, the minors and tweaking that slider. His FIP was actually even better than that, which is hard to do. Uh, and now he's apparently throwing 
about two miles an hour harder in spring training than Patrick Sandoval is a guy that, you know, we've talked about a lot. Changeup has been his bread and butter, but he didn't really have the feel for it last season in the way that he did the year before. That forced him to rely on his slider, which actually became a very good pitch for him. He went from throwing it about 13% of the time, I, I think, in 2021 to about 30%. It was his most used pitch last season. Good quality of contact metrics, good swing and miss metrics on that one. If he can get the changeup and slider working at the same time, I think Patrick Sandoval could take a big step forward. You know, he had kind of a good ERA last season, but he wasn't all that good. I think we could see like 28% strikeout rate, good ERA, improved whip from last year. I, I think Patrick Sandoval is someone that I, uh, I think just could take a skill step. I think with pitchers in particular, if you can identify those that either made a pitch mix change or improved mm -hmm. their velocity, or in the case of Reed Detmers, I guess doing both, both of those things, yeah. uh, I think that matters a lot. And uh, I saw an article, we're recording this on Thursday, I saw an article about Robbie Ray so far in spring mm -hmm. training where his velocity has been up and he's got a new splitter that he's incorporating as well. We know that he's always had mm -hmm. a pretty hard fastball and a really good slider. I mean, if the velocity is up, they're mixing in a splitter, I haven't really been on Robbie Ray, but that's kind of interesting to me. So yeah, that, I know that's you guys are kind of out on him. Uh, oh, I, just I know Frank month. more so, but yeah. yeah, I I'm fine with him as my number two starting pitcher. I've got him in that like twenty ish range. I'm pretty sure at starting pitcher, and uh, I don't really. It's not a guy that I need to see good things from in spring training, but I, I'll welcome them. I love to hear good things about a player I already like. Love confirmation bias. Another pitcher in that mold is Joe Ryan that we've heard good things about, you know, adding two different pitches, I think a sweeper and a, a splitter as well. And velocity being up for him, Pablo Lopez. We talked about him recently. Mm -hmm. Velocity was up. It was one start. I think he only threw three or four innings. So like maybe he just emptied the tank for those three or four. So don't want to overrate that, but he's throwing a new improved sweeper type curveball drink every time you hear the word sweeper <laughs> it's just like all right well that's that's the trendy pitch and in fact yeah. uh stack has actually made it its own separate classification right mm -hmm. it's it's like it's it's just it's just a new pitch that's that's entered the the conversation in baseball now it's own separate pitch um yeah uh, also i mean the the reports that um patrick sandoval's regained the feel for his changeup after mm -hmm. losing it last year i think that's notable um just on the subject of other breakout players because of the skills, the underlying skills. Vinny P, baby. Yes. <laughs> Got to bring him Absolutely. up. Absolutely, yeah. He, he's very much better expected stats than his actual stats. Pull heavy profile, so it should lead to pretty good power production, even in a very tough park. I think Vinny P is kind of one of the more obvious breakout candidates. And, uh, and then Lars, new, Lars Newbar, who yep. has a lot of... Um, helium right now as well last name i'll mention is Rowanzi Contreras with the pirates who does have some prospect pedigree when he came up late last season he was throwing a slider near nearly 40 percent of the time and that is far and away his best pitch so i uh, like to see him leaning into that as well let's take our first break here and we'll be back on fantasy baseball today This next question is from Nick. I think it's a good one for Scotty. Keep up the great work, guys. You make draft season so much more enjoyable. Two questions for you. What is Jared Schuster's value if he breaks camp with the Braves? Is he must roster given the successes of Kyle Wright and Waskar Enoa when they first came up? I think sometimes we get a little bit lazy with these comps where it's like, oh, just because a player in the past on a certain team had success when, you know, not when they first got called up because Kyle Wright was up before that, but does that mean it will happen for future pitchers? I don't think that's necessarily the case, but there are other reasons to like Jared Schuster. Uh, Scott, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I first I want to say that I'm I'm not confident it is going to go to Jared Schuster. Dylan Dodd has been making a very strong impression as well, and I, I might be even more excited about him. Uh, but Schuster is somebody who has performed well in the minors. He was a first round pick by the same, uh, the same um, head of scouting who, you know, drafted Michael Harris and Spencer Strider. And now he's, 
He did such a good job in that role for the Braves that he's now the Astros GM. So, like, even though Jared Schuster isn't somebody who has a lot of prospect shine, just based on the production and based on um, how the organization feels about him, I, I could see him being... I, I could see him surpassing expectations. He is more of a... Um, crafty lefty I'm, lo, throws low 90s i mean i don't know what crafty translates he's not jamie moyer but <laughs> he throws low 90s so not especially hard it's more he has a great change up and i think he's developed a good enough breaking ball that that might be enough um but like i said i, I think i like dylan dodd even more either one whoever wins this role for the Braves, whether it's schuster or dodd i uh we're talking we're talking probably not worth drafting in a standard 12 team league, probably just a little outside of that, more like monitoring early in the season to see if they're worth picking up. The second question here, I have the eighth pick in a 10 team head to head points league with daily lineups. I'm really intrigued with taking Fernando Tatis with my second pick, given the potential upside, but feel I'll be, I'd be doing a disservice to myself to take someone who's suspended and also been out for a while over someone with a safer floor who may be available in shallower drafts like Freddie Freeman, Mike Trout, Rafael Devers, or Manny Machado. Chris, you are our resident Fernando Tatis advocate. What do you think about taking him? I guess that would be 12th overall, not 13th overall. 13th overall, yeah. It's a little early, a tad bit. I have him 12th, so it's yeah. not early for me. Um, and I think you're kind of thinking about it the wrong, the, in the opposite direction, emailer, whose name, uh, uh, Nick. Um, the shallower your league is, I think the more upside you should be chasing because – the floor is always going to be relatively high. The replacement level on your waiver wire in a 10-team points league is going to be really high. You're going to be talking about really viable starting caliber players that are out there. Obviously, they're not going to replace Manny Machado if something happens to Fernando Tatis, but like, it's very unlikely in a 10-team head-to-head points league that you're going to be really in a hole for three weeks without Fernando Tatis. And once he gets back, he might be the best player, even in a head-to-head points league. So. I think uh, I'm. I, I still like the idea of taking him there. He, I think he's like the perfect. If you pick late in the first round, he's the perfect second round pick, pretty much for for any team build and any format and any anything that you want to do. I just think the upside is so high that it's worth chasing there. This next one is from Chris Towers. Different Chris. Dynasty Welsh. Hit, <laughs> Chris Welsh. There you go. It's from Chris Welsh. Dynasty head-to-head categories. Actually, it makes sense now. It's a dynasty question. Should I trade Tim Anderson for Chris Sale? I have Tatis, Wander Franco, and Tommy Edmond at shortstop, but realize Tatis and Edmond may lose shortstop after this year, trying to win this season. Tim Anderson for Sale. Well, it, Wander won't lose after this year. Correct. I, I mean, just to, at face value, it's it's not an even trade. Tim Anderson in a categories league pretty much always gets drafted ahead of Sale. Uh, is it close enough that to meet your team's needs, it might be worth doing? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd shop. I'd, I'd shop Tim Anderson a little harder to get kind of alternatives are out there. He could do better than Sale, and I like Sale a lot. Uh, I think some people listening to this are like, "Why would you bother with Sale? He's always hurt." Uh, but I don't feel that way. I think that the injuries he dealt with last year were more fluke accidents than injuries suffered in the process of playing baseball. Um, so I could see doing this, but I'd shop Anderson a little harder at first. You don't have to take the first offer that comes your way. I will also say you don't have to make a trade right now. And Tim Anderson seems like a guy who could very quickly rebuild his value and same for Chris sale actually. But you know, when you're talking about trade value, part of it is what part of the curve you're trading a guy on. And I think you're probably trading Tim Anderson closer to the low point of his value than the high point. And he's someone who could absolutely come out, light the world on fire in April. And all of a sudden you have a much more valuable trade asset. So, you know, if you, uh, I, maybe you can't start all of Anderson, Wander Franco and Tommy Edmond, but like 
you've got Tatis, so you've got a lineup spot to play with for three weeks. So I, I, I might wait and see what happens there. You know, wait until Tatis is back before you have to make a, a decision. And even Edmonds flexibility should give you a little bit of breathing room there as well. This next one's from Eric, dear Mo, Greg, and Andrew. Well, those are Vaughn's, obviously. Oh, yeah. You know, I loved which one. I think it was Mo Vaughn, right? He had the interesting batting stance where he was just like, yeah, he's just like just, crouched and real. Yeah. Just barely look over his right arm while he was batting. Mm-hmm. I, 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 don't, I don't know how he made that work. Yeah. I believe they were brothers, weren't they, Greg and Mo? That I do I, not know. Let me confirm. Mo Vaughn, Greg Vaughn, brothers. Uh, he is the cousin. cousin. They're cousins. Okay. Yeah, it looks like that's correct. Anywho, yeah. here's the question. When, when I Googled Greg Vaughn, I got the uh, star of the young and the restless first. So not not related to Mo Vaughn, that one. I play in a 20-team Roto League and an in-person auction draft. It's a five outfielder league with a corner infield spot, middle infield spot, two catchers, and the regular positions along with nine pitching slots. 20 teams with two catchers? I mean, why? Why? Do you have any deep league sleepers that you would try and target at a reasonable price? Love the show and really enjoy your insight. Scott, I believe that you have a deep sleeper article either out or coming out soon. I don't know if you've started gathering those mm-hmm. names anywhere, but do you guys have any I have. On top of your head? Okay, so, so this I, is going 40 deep at catcher. I'm not sure even in the deep sleepers article, um, I'm going to have a lot of names that you're not already familiar with in, in this size league. I think just like generally undervalued who are going outside the top 300 Eric Haas, who's supposed to be the primary care catcher for Detroit and has big power and finished last year strong. Uh, Christian Bethacourt, who I think is going to get the majority of the playing time there for the Rays, has a little bit of speed too. Um, to go along with decent pop. Nick Fortes of the Marlins, if he can secure more playing time there. I mean, these are kind of two catcher leagues just for, you know, 15 team leagues. Uh, two, Yeah, 15 team two catcher formats. These guys tend to get drafted there. I would also suggest not overlooking Mitch Garver, who probably isn't beginning the year with catcher eligibility. He's probably DH only, but he's supposed to split his time between catcher and DH. So, by week three, I would imagine you could actually use Mitch Garver at catcher, and he still has, relative to the position, a lot of upside. And this is probably the deepest one I, I can recommend. Luis Luis Campusano of the like Padres, who has been a consistent deliverer in their minor league system and has been passed over for a few years, but it looks like he's going to make the roster as the backup to Austin Nola, and it wouldn't take much for him to wrestle away the majority of the playing time there. I think he's definitely the better um, better bet offensively between the two. Two very deep league names. Blake Sable with the oh, yeah, San, that's Francisco, a good one. Yeah. San Francisco Giants. Him. He he might get some like outfield and DH at bats with the team, but uh, in most leagues, I think he has catcher eligibility. Yaner Diaz is one with the Houston Astros. Really big numbers in the minors last year. I don't know if Eric wanted only catcher sleepers, so I just wrote down. Yeah, I didn't read it that way. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to list off a bunch of guys, and you, you tell me but, if you like any of these names. But also Francisco Alvarez, before we move on from the catcher sleepers, big upside there. So I wrote down Michael Massey, Elvis Andrus, Bryce Terang, Spencer Steer, Brett Beatty. Those were some deeper league infielders I like. Absolutely. Uh, Outfielders, Josh Lowe, Alec Thomas, Sal Freelich, Matt Veerling, Stone Garrett, David Peralta, Will Benson. I like Alec Thomas a lot. I like Sal Freelich a lot. Uh, Spencer Steer, someone you mentioned in the infielders, I think is uh, a very good choice. Um, Did did you mention Jake, Jake Fraley? I did not, but I know you like him. Yeah. Yeah, his ADP is really low, 328 overall. I think TJ uh, Friedel is kind of interesting, too, for the Reds. Look, I'm still putting Alex Kirilov in this group. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> seems to want to have anything to do with him anymore. I also, saw, I saw a report the other day. He's going to start the season on the I.L. Okay, well, doesn't mean he's going to finish the season on the I.L. He may oh. finish the season on the I.L., but like uh, that, that's well, not a reason not to draft him. Here's a guy who's who went undrafted in my 15 team Roto league. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean he'll go undrafted in a 20 team Roto league, but this is, 
you know, we're talking his ADP is 447.6 in NFC drafts right now. And that's Trevor Story, who, yeah, you'll have to stash him. We don't know when he's going to be back. But if it ends up being like a June return for him, that could be a hugely impactful player in a 20 team league who is going super, super late. Do so. I don't expect Story back till the second half, but do you expect Frank Kirloff to play more games than Story this year? No. Really? Well, that would explain why you're not drafting him then. I would be surprised if Kirilov didn't play more games than Story, but I suppose. I'm, I'm super pessimistic on Kirilov, Scott. I, I just, I, but I do this thing where I, I kind of overreact and then I just tell myself, no, nah, it's over for this guy. Like, he's just done. <laughs> I kind of feel that way about Kirilov. Like, I just don't know I, if the wrist is ever going to hold up enough for him to be even even a he, semi-regular player. I mean, part of the thing is like, I mean, you look at what he did in the minors last year, Kirilov. Um, and obviously the wrist was still bothering him. I think he needs to get to a point where he says, okay, I've done everything I can do for it. They, they've, they freaking shaved the bone down to make it smaller. There's nothing more that can be done. If I'm going to have a major league career, I just have to figure out how to play through it. And I think he's kind of, we're kind of at that point with him. If he wants this, he just has to do the best he can with it. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, probably right about that. I, I guess I just kind of fall on the more negative um, view. He, of it. Here's a player who is out of sight, out of mind right now, uh, unless you're watching the Netherlands in the World Baseball Classic. But Jerkson Profar has been linked to the Colorado Rockies. That would obviously be... A huge help for his value, but he hasn't signed yet. His ADP is 43.1 in NFC drafts. He's someone that, I mean, if he signed with the Rockies, I think he'd definitely be worth drafting in a 12-team league. So, uh, yeah, jerks and Profar. You know, the Rockies management is just sitting there, Chris, and who are who's the young player that people are getting excited about on our team? Hmm, Nolan Jones, maybe? Let's sign jerks and wow. so far. No one's actually getting excited about Nolan Jones. I, you know, while we're talking about deep sleepers, I'll just mention his name as well. A sure. couple of pitchers, Matthew Boyd, Domingo Herman, Nick Martinez, Kyle Bradish, Jose Suarez. And this guy's been rising, but Brendan fought with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Yeah. I think is someone who should be on your radar. Did you, did you mention Michael Massey? I did, Scott. I, mm-hmm. I led with him in my infielders. And I assume you mentioned Anthony Volpe too. I didn't. But I, I think he's kind of moving into like shallow league discussion. Yeah. But yes, you should draft him as well. How about uh, Mitch Keller and uh, Braxton Garrett, who showed some really interesting skills last season uh, for pitchers. And there was another one that I had here. Oh, Kerry Carpenter, not a pitcher, an outfielder for the Detroit Tigers. He's having a good spring, put up big numbers in the minors last season. There's stuff to like about him. Bailey Ober. Yes, sure. they might go Who's, six man rotation. They now. might go six man the twins and his yep. fastball velocity. Like his fastball is always played up beyond the velocity, but his fastball velocity is up a couple miles per hour this spring. And he great uh, controls. The whip should be good. I mean, Luis, we could do this all day, but Luis Ortiz, <laughs> Pittsburgh Pirates pitcher. I was gonna say, how long can we go until we just like Luke Voigt? <laughs> That's uh, like see what so you, you you asked if I'd made my list of deep sleepers yet. It's about a hundred long at this point, so I have to pare it down quite a bit. There's a lot of fun ones too. Last one, I swear, kind of similar to Kerry Carpenter, Kyle Stowers with the uh, Baltimore Orioles. Let's get into some Apple Podcast review questions. This one's from John Thundergun, dear Chaz, Pip, and Rex. I do not know this one. No idea. No. I'll probably look these up beforehand because sometimes I ah. get nervous that they could be something bad. But those are the main characters from the 1994 American comedy film Airheads, starring Brendan Fraser, recent Oscar winner. Ah. That movie sounds right up your Steve alley. Steve Buscemi's funny. in that movie. <laughs> wow. I was gonna say, wow, I love that. Yeah, I'm surprised you haven't seen that. That's an Adam Sandler movie. <laughs> I'm surprised I haven't seen it either. I play in an 11 team six by five roto. OPS is the added category, and it's a keeper league. My four keepers are Kyle Tucker in the 11th, Corbin Burns in the 14th, Shohei Otani in the 15th, and Julio Rodriguez in the 16th. Am I crazy to try and flip one of those guys for a first round pick and keep Corbin Carroll in the 17th round? For mm. contacts, Paul context paul goldschmidt would be the 11th best hitter when factoring in keepers essentially would you trade any of those names for corbin carroll and at worst paul goldschmidt 
Well, that's... The, something you have to factor in is how long are you able to keep the player you're trading mm -hmm. with at this price? Because they're all amazing first rounders, basically, that you're keeping beyond round 10. Um, but Corbin Carroll has comparable upside. I mean, who knows if he'll live up to it? I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, but can't guarantee it, of course. And so Corbin I, Carroll could be anything. He could even be Kyle Tucker. You know how much you've always exactly. wanted one of those. You're getting, you're yeah, getting, no, I get you're getting more than just Kyle Tucker. You're getting a first round non keeper as well. Um, so I'm leaning yes to doing this mm -hmm. in an 11 team league. You need as many impactful hitters, impactful players as you could get. The question is, which one? Do you I think trade? it's Tucker. That's the hardest part to figure out. I mean, Tucker has the highest cost in 11th round pick, but we're in a range of the draft where I'm I'm not as concerned about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone's I might close do Burns. enough. I might do Burns just because I'm so anti-pitching at this point. And you'd have, you know, it's it's not like it would be over. You'd have Tucker Rodriguez and you have Carroll in your outfield. So good outfield. Uh, not like more than you need. But it's it's... I definitely wouldn't trade Julio Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. That, but I could consider any of the others. All right. Well, before we get to our next question, let's take our final break here on Fantasy Baseball Today. Well, what do you think we're going to uncover out there? With some luck, maybe a green jacket as sharp as the one you get when you win the Masters. It's a tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. This one's from Maxman O. In a daily 10-team Roto Keeper League, planning on keeping Carl Sordon in the 11th, even with the forearm concern. Also keeping Otani in the 5th. I get his full value in a daily lineup league. Prior to Rodon's injury, I was planning to wait on drafting starting pitcher because I had two very strong pitchers. Now that Rodon is going on the IL, how much, if at all, should it impact my strategy? Should I now consider taking a starting pitcher with my third or fourth round pick? 10 team league. Uh, let's see. Wait on drafting. Okay. Cause you had two very strong ones. Sorry. I'm kind of having to process this a little bit. Um, I was sorry, say... Scott. I had to leave you dangling. Cause there was a, a siren car going past my apartment. And it was very, very loud. So that's fine. I should have been a more attentive listener as Frank was leading the question, reading the question. I don't think it should change much, but I'm I'm the person who waits beyond round three and four to take my first pitcher anyway. So like if if you just if you're not comfortable with that, then I I, I guess take a pitcher if you want one. It's like not very helpful, but like just my general pitching strategy this year, particularly in a roto league like this, is I'm not taking one. I'm not thinking about taking one probably till round five in, in a ten team or maybe round six. So it doesn't it doesn't move me personally. Whereas know. for me, getting a starting pitcher in the third, the fifth, and the eleventh kind of sounds like my strategy. So I, I think you should, and I, I think you know if you could get a Justin Verlander to pair with Otani and. Uh, Carlos Rodon, I'd feel very, very good about that. And, you know, obviously those would be the only pitchers that I would take in that range. And I, I'd probably, you know, wait even longer than the 11th to take, you know, number four, but that's, that'd be a heck of a start for a, for a pitching staff. This next one's from John. Hey, Athos, Aramis and Porthos. Those are the three musketeers, not the candy bar. Ah. The the French guys with yeah. the funny hats. I saw them. I saw them on Three Musketeers candy bar commercials back in the day, with Fran Dresser, Dresser. There was that fourth guy, Darton. Uh, yeah, love that guy. Dart. Yeah, I think that's his name. I never had a Three Musketeers candy bar. Is it good? It's not very good. What? No. no. What? That wasn't a tape. Never I had one. Taste. That happened. No, I've I've never had one. I don't know if it's good or not. How how have you managed to avoid? Like, did you do Halloween? Did didn't you have a bag full of candy at the end? And and none of them was ever a Three Musketeers. It's just gross. I don't think it's so. But like I probably, nougat covered in chocolate. Who wants that? I probably just avoided it because there were so many other things I knew were good. So I'm like, let me not experiment. I'll just go with what works. <laughs> so that's that's how I've gotten it's this smart. Um. 
it's it's not my favorite. It's just it has this weird like chocolate chocolate nougat. nougat yeah, it looks yeah, like it's fluffy. like a fluffy fluffy chocolate nougat interior. It's not very good. It's a very mild chocolate flavor covered in you know not mild milk chocolate. So you don't even really taste the fluffy part. It's just it's just kind of a textural yeah. um, sensation. I would say a Three Musketeers bar. Uh, now I kind of want to try one. So I think uh, we'll we'll have one of those for dessert later on today. First A Team Name Tuesday submission, the Devers ending story. That's pretty solid, yeah. Okay. Second, my pitching in my 10-team head-to-head points league is Corbin Burns, Sandy Alcantara, Framber Valdez, Nestor Cortez, Hunter Green, Chris Sale, Jesus Lozardo, and Patrick Sandoval. Sounds pretty awesome. I really like Edward Cabrera's stuff and upside. Is there anyone I could drop for him? I don't think so, Chris. I recently moved Edward Cabrera up, but I moved him just behind Patrick Sandoval because I think at his best, you kind of want Edward Cabrera to be Patrick Sandoval. So, yeah, I like Edward Cabrera quite a bit, but I still have him ranked behind Patrick Sandoval. It's actually not all that close. It's about 50 spots in the overall rankings, probably 10 spots in the pitcher rankings. So, I do have Sandoval pretty clear because, well, the case for a Cabrera is upside, but Sandoval's got quite a bit of upside too. So, yep. you know, he, he's got two swing and miss pitches. He's got, you know, he throws hard ish, at least for a lefty. His fastball hasn't been great, but you know, if there's any improvement in the fastball or if the sinker is, you know, used more, I think Sandoval has got a ton of upside of, of, his, of his own. This next one's from technically Amish. Okay. I'm in a head to head standard five by five category salary cap league. That was a mouthful word salad. Rate my team. All righty. William Contreras at catcher, Paul Goldschmidt, Ozzy Albies, Manny Machado, O'Neill Cruz, Randy Rosarena, George Springer, Lars Nupar in the outfield with Luis Arise and Hunter Renfro at utility. Bryce Harper is on the bench. At pitcher, at pitcher, you have Hugh Darvish, Framber Valdez. Christian Javier, Lucas Giolito, Pablo Lopez, Edward Cabrera, Jose Urquidy, relievers, Camilo Duvall, Daniel Bard, Craig Kimbrell. The only problem here it doesn't say if it's a 10 or 12 team league. Yeah, because that, that'd be a really strong 12 team league. And even in a 10 team league, it seems pretty good. So I'm going to say it's a it's an A. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like, I, I think I, you might be a little light on steals. You know, you've got like a couple of 20 ish guys, but that's nitpicking. Yeah, I I, th- I think it'll be OK. I'm just trying to imagine interpreting this question as a listener who doesn't have isn't able to look at the team right in front of them. and just has to yeah. remember the names Frank said. <laughs> it's a tough, tough one for a podcast. Yeah, bad job, me from Jim Lulo. <laughs> Hello, Paul, Gene and Ace. That's Kiss. That is Kiss. Yeah. I think they're having like a yeah, last concert ever. Yeah, they're they're like I mean, you know, you know how that works. Elton John did a farewell tour that lasted like six years. So you know, yeah. my <laughs> brother asked me if I wanted to go. He was a huge Kiss fan growing up, but I don't think I'm gonna go. I I want to rock and roll all night Who and does? party every day. <laughs> Can you guys speak on salary cap strategies going into the year? Well. We just did a podcast on it. So I think you should go back and listen to that one. We also did a three-part salary cap draft, the entire thing. So you can hear us fighting about players, cadence, nominations, bidding process, all that fun stuff. So I would say uh, we pretty much covered all of it. So go back and listen to some of those podcasts. Chris, I was going to ask you about this beforehand, but you know what? We're live. So why not just ask you right now? This one's from Mike in Rochester. I was wondering when slash if you will be releasing the printable draft prep packet tiers, rankings, etc. cetera? Uh, I think I'm going to put the finishing touches on that today, actually. So there's switches and levers that need to be pulled on the backside. I don't know, uh, but hopefully that'll be ready on cbssports.com slash fantasy slash baseball Friday. So check it out. Nice. All right, let's wrap up with some I know we're not supposed to do keeper questions anymore. These are just ones that have been left over for weeks and weeks. So let's just kind of run through some of these. These come from Apple podcast reviews as well from Latenzo Von Matterhorn. Dear Mike, Pat, Jim, and Dave. That's uh, I'm going to pull one out of my rear end and say like 
Baltimore Orioles pitchers. They were some from like of, the 80s. They were some kind of pitchers. Let me. Someone's probably yelling at the podcast again. How did you guys not know this? I mean, they're just such common names, except for what's the least common of them? Pat. Yeah. Or maybe, maybe what? that's the. No, I don't know. I don't know. They are. Oh, yes. Good job, Chris. It was. The 420 uh, game winners for the Orioles in 1971. 1971. Wow. That was, Jim Palmer. That was impressive. Dave right. McNally. Mike Cuellar. Is that how you pronounce that? And Pat Dobson. Yeah. Way to go. You all freaking rock. Even Frank. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'll follow Scott White anywhere. If Scott says nacho cheese is the best ice cream topping, I'm going to Sam's Club to get one of those gallons of cheese and a few pints of Briars. Oh, man. Okay. If Scott tells me to fade puppies, sunny days, and bats, well, you can catch me in a raincoat with my new cat in the shower. I have a lot of power over yeah, this, man. Scott, Scott, Scott. A lot of power. That's scary. All right. Well, this question is for you then, Scotty. Pick six keepers in a 12-team head-to-head categories, daily lineup league. There are lots of names. Trey Turner, Juan Soto, Manny Machado, Jose Altuve, Michael Harris, Randy Arozarena, Ozzy Albies, Justin Verlander, Carlos Rodon, Devin Williams, Dalton Varsho, Vinny P. Baby. And O'Neal Cruz. Well, there are no like contingencies to keeping any of these players. You're probably just keeping your best players then. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be Trey Turner, Juan Soto, Manny Machado, Jose Altuve, Michael Harris, and it's between Rosa Reina and Verlander for the last spot. Come on, Scott, get one pitcher in there. I don't want to. All right, well, you know Latenzo is not listening to me, so he's only listening to you. Go with the Rosarena. All right. No caution to the wind at starting pitcher. You got two, you got three great outfielders to start off, as well as a third baseman and a second a second baseman. Yeah, too, base. So you're you're in great shape. This one's from Crazy Danny. Keeper question. Six by six Roto salary cap league, five hundred and twenty dollar budget. Why don't you just use 260? I don't. <laughs> All right. Corbin Carroll for 20. Rafael Devers for 70. Justin Verlander for 30. Alec Manoa for 30. Emmanuel Class A for 30. Uh, how this, this is, it's easy to just chop it in half so we can. But but that's not really how it works. No, that's that's because true. you can still get dollar players. So the way anytime my rule of thumb is anytime you increase the salary cap budget a the high end player should be most impacted more of the money should go to the high end players that than the, than just distributing it equally yeah but these are all high end players so yes you know so, if we're thinking in terms of carol for 10 devers for 35 verlander for 15 manoa for 15 class a for 15 that is just if you cut the values in half that all yeah. sounds Really good to me. Uh, he needs four. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would say, uh, which two do you throw back? You can throw back Manoa. Mm -hmm. And you only need to throw back one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. So I think you take Class A at 30 over Manoa at 30. I think, yeah. especially with Diaz going down too, to lock down that, yeah. you know, now the clear top closer in fantasy yeah. manual Class A, I, I would do that. That's not something we talked about on the podcast, but just like the ripple effect throughout the relief yep. pitcher position, I think could be significant, especially in Roto Leagues and especially the deeper the Roto League. But Class A probably gets pushed into round three. And, you know, Clay Holmes and Camilo Duvall probably get drafted closer to, to like the Ryan Presleys of the world now. Because nobody's going to be like, Oh, I'm just going to go without saves since Diaz isn't available. People are going to be trying harder to, and that's going to affect every other team, who of course needs saves as well. And and you know one one thing that we neglected to mention during the deep sleepers discussion, but you should be drafting Liam Hendricks in your deeper leagues. We we have no idea what his timetable is going to be. You know, obviously he's going through treatment for uh, lymphoma, but he was at spring training at least at one point i haven't really seen anything since but he threw a bullpen session during spring training so like 
it's possible he pitches this year. Yeah, that is Liam Hendricks. Let's move on to our next question from Nick. Dear Mac, Charlie, and Dennis. That's, That's always, always sunny. sunny. Correct. A show I have seen some episodes of. Not the entire series. Ten a lot team. of episodes, as I understand. Uh, yeah, there is a lot. 10-team head-to-head categories league. Choose three keepers. Manoa in the 19th. Gunnar Henderson in the 20th. Corbin Carroll in the 21st. Robbie Ray in the 23rd. Adolis Garcia in the 24th. Ooh. I'm inclined to keep the first three there. Manoa in the 19th. Henderson in the 20th. Carroll in the 21st. I think it's even easier to do if you get to keep players at a comparable discount for multiple years because I mean, Henderson and Carroll, um, th- these, th- those costs could even look, could look even more impressive in future seasons as impressive as they look now. I agree with that. The only thing I would add is if you're just focusing on this year, or if that value doesn't carry over, I would take Adolis Garcia over Gunnar Henderson, but I'm sure I'm on an Island with that one. This one's from Coombs 11 M. In a 16-team 5x5 head-to-head categories, starting pitcher categories are strikeouts, ERA, and whip. Starting this year, we're also using a category called QA3 in place (laughs) of quality starts. QA3 is when a pitcher goes 5-plus innings with less than a 4.5 ERA. This is just quality start sliding scale. Basically, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, Knowing this, which one pitcher would you choose out of Merrill Kelly, Drew Rasmussen, Jose Barrios, Jeffrey Springs, and Jordan Montgomery? Um, it springs for me. Springs. Yeah, I mean, Springs I is my so, highest rank yeah. anyway. Yep. All right, this one's from T-Money, Deer, Shoop, Chainsaw, and Dave. No idea. Please don't be something explicit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. It looks like Something called Summer School? Yeah, don't know this. Don't know this movie. Seven movie. Oh, starring NCIS heartthrob Mark Har- Thomas Mark Harmon. <laughs> do, there you go. Do, does every normal just human have this amount of knowledge, or is it just Chris? Just oh, like, no, I'm just looking at the Wikipedia page. Oh, okay. I have no idea. Yes, never, he has never heard of this. the knowledge of the internet at his fingertips. Somebody who uh, regularly... Goes to trivia. That would make sense. 10 team, five by five, Roto League. I can keep two players. I'm locked in on O'Neill Cruz in the 15th round. Would you keep Shane McClanahan in the eighth round or Adley Rutschman in the 21st? Let me help your decision. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talks. Here comes the yeah. money. I mean, that's what I was inclined to say anyway. Obviously, great value for Rushman, but I. Even even speaking as somebody who's fading early round pitchers, I, I just think the the ace caliber pitcher in McClanahan is going to be more impactful than the stud catcher. If if Rushman is even a stud catcher, because that remains a bit unproven. This last one is from Fantasy God Twenty One Year Two in the twelve team in a twelve team Scott White Dynasty League settings. For second base, do you take Brandon Lau for eight bucks, Luis Arise for seven, or Jake Cronenworth for five? I'm a Brandon Lau guy, uh, so I'm keeping him. Yeah, I and mean, he's the one I rank highest for this year, and I don't think the three dollars difference between him and Cronenworth is significant. This is a points league, by the way, uh, so that helps Cronenworth's value. Cronenworth obviously has the multi eligibility, but even so. I agree that Brandon Lau is who I want here. All right. We're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thank you all for watching and listening fantasy baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. We'll be back again next week. Bye-bye.